Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third highlight lecture of this Congress. As you look up in the Valencia sky, you see many more stars than I do in my home place in Germany. If you use a space observatory like Hubble or similar, you see many, many more stars you get a much deeper view into the universe, which is not only deep and far away, but it's also back in time, so you can access the universe in its young age. You find fascinating worlds there, but you also very soon come to the limit of our knowledge. Dark matter, dark energy constitute 95% of our universe, but these words just mask our lack of understanding what's going on. And it's not chance that just a few days ago the Nobel Prize in Physics has gone to two researchers that used the Kobe satellite to look at the microwave background. It is also not chance that one of the leading scientists in cosmology comes here from Spain. I'm very happy to introduce to you Professor Javier Barcons. He's a research professor at the Spanish Council for Scientific Research, the Institute of Physics of Cantabria, and comes from the city of Santander. He is a specialist in X-ray astronomy. He was a co-investigator on XMM Newton. He is involved in the futuristic plans for the Xeos uh, expedition. And his preferred toys are black holes. And you will see in a minute what I mean. I think we cannot get a better person to explain to us the origin and development of our universe. Javier, the, word, the floor goes to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for such a wonderful introduction. It is a real honor for me to be here, and I will try to entertain you for the next 40 minutes or so. Um, um, and talking about um, cosmology, about the origin and development of the universe. Um, just to set up the scene a little bit, this is a um, nice picture from the WMAP satellite uh, explaining very briefly what's the history of our universe. We are on the right, we see in the sky stars, galaxies, and all these bright things that we can witness on a clear night. Um, if we look into the past, which means, as Bernd explained to us, going further away, looking back into the past, we would see how these galaxies were forming, and if we look more into the past, we would see atoms, maybe ions, and looking extremely into the past, we may see the Big Bang. Um, uh, to uh, gain a bit more of insight into these very early phases, of the universe, we can look at this logarithmic history of the universe, where we blow up what happened on the very first um, split seconds in the history of the universe. Uh, we know that the light elements, hydrogen, um, 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 converted into helium, deuterium, lithium, and those light elements were formed when the universe was just a few minutes old. Um, and even before that, many other things like inflation that I will talk about in a minute uh, happened in the history of our universe. And we need to understand all this to set up the initial conditions to the development of the universe and to end up understanding how galaxies, clusters of galaxies, stars and planets, which is what we see in our sky, formed. This is about my only view graph 
of facts that we think we know, and many of my other biographs will be about what we would like to understand. So what I think we know quite solidly is that the universe is expanding. We know that since the 20s, 1920s and 1930s, um, the universe began with a hot Big Bang, and in fact the very existence of the cosmic microwave background um, um, uh, proves that. And in fact it proves that the universe, at some stage in the past, it was hotter than several thousand degrees, and that matter and radiation were in equilibrium. I will uh, devote a few minutes because of this Nobel Prize that I think I, I cannot skip in my next biograph. Um, we also know that um, helium and deuterium, which are elements, helium is produced in stars, but not enough to give the 25% of helium that we see in today's universe. We know that most of the helium in the universe was produced when the universe was only a few minutes old. Deuterium is destroyed by stars, so all the deuterium that we see in the universe was also formed in those first minutes. Um, we also know how old our universe is. It's about 14 billion years old, and that matches the ages of the oldest astronomical objects that we know, the globular clusters. Um, we also know that the universe had to go through some sort of inflationary phase where it expanded dramatically at many orders of magnitude. It grew by many orders of magnitude in, in the first split second of its history. I, I will explain a bit more what this means. And the most astonishing um, thing about our universe is that we know that the largest fraction of it is dark. We cannot see it. It's made of dark matter and dark energy. And I will try to explain what this means. But I think I cannot skip talking about this Nobel Prize that we knew yesterday uh, that has been granted to those American scientists, John Mother and George Wood, who uh, promoted and flew a small mission in 1989 called COBE, Cosmic Background Explorer. It was really a very small mission, but for the first time, it, it produced two major discoveries. The first one was that the cosmic microwave background, which is a relict, it's the echo from the Big Bang itself, it has a perfect black body spectrum, which is plotted in this original diagram. And in fact, this comes from just nine minutes of integration with this instrument, FIRAS. The first nine minutes of that mission produced this Astonishing result. There is no deviation whatsoever from a perfect black body spectrum in the cosmic microwave background. That means that matter and light in the past of our universe had to be in perfect equilibrium. And that means that the temperature of the universe sometime in the past had to be above 4,000 degrees. Otherwise, you cannot get equilibrium between matter and radiation. So that was the first very important discovery of this satellite. The second one was the detection for the first time of tiny fluctuations, tiny anisotropies in this microwave background. Those anisotropies are just the picture of the seeds of today's galaxies and clusters of galaxies. The microwave background is giving us a picture of the universe when it was only about 400,000 years old. Remember that today it's 14 billion years old. So it, this is a picture of the universe in its very infancy. And those ripples and little mountains and valleys, which are extremely small in amplitude, those are the seeds of all the structures that we see today, but of course before they started growing. That was the other very important contribution of that mission to cosmology. And I think this Nobel Prize is certainly very well deserved by those two scientists. Um, and um, I think I'll skip this one because I'll go into it in a second. Um, so my talk has two parts. One, I will talk about the origin of the universe, about the substrate of the universe, if you want to see it like it. And the second part, I will talk about the components that we can see in our universe. 
Of course, we cannot see dark matter or dark energy. We have to see ordinary matter that can shine, emit light, gravity waves, or anything that we can detect with our instrumentation. And I will finish with a very short um, conclusions. Okay, so the origin of the universe, um, uh, as I've been saying several times, we know that at the very early universe, there was a phase, a very short phase, where the universe expanded dramatically, and we call that inflation. I will tell you in a second why we know that. Then, many, many years later, in fact, almost 400,000 years later, matter and radiation stopped to be in equilibrium because the universe was expanding and it was cooling, so the temperature was too low for matter and radiation to be kept in equilibrium. That radiation is what we see today in the form of the microwave background, and the matter then collapsed and formed galaxies, stars, planets, and whatever we see. So inflation is actually the very beginning. It's the initial conditions for our story. It's where the seeds for those galaxies, clusters, stars were formed. That's where everything began, and that's what we want to understand. The other big question to understand the substrate of our universe is what the universe is made of. And here you have this cheese diagram where you see how devastating this is. We know that dark matter, which is matter, but that doesn't shine, it doesn't emit any light by definition, constitutes 23% of our universe. How do we know that dark matter is there? We know it because it produces gravitation, and gravity we can measure indirectly. But... 73% of the universe is made of something which is even more strange, which is dark energy. This is not even matter. This is something else. It has a very strange equation of state. It has negative pressure. I wonder whether you can imagine what negative pressure means. It's very difficult for me. Um, but that's what we get when we do cosmological measurements. And only a ridiculous 4% is made of ordinary matter. And as I will show you in a second, we only know 50% of this ordinary matter where it resides. The other 50%, we still have to find it. So those are, for me, the two largest questions that we have to solve if we want to know the substrate of our universe. Now, what is inflation? I've been mentioning this name several times. Inflation is a short period of accelerated expansion in the very early st stages of our universe. We know it happened sometime between 10 to the minus 43 seconds and 10 to the minus 33 seconds in the life of our universe. We know that the physics in these very early stages of the universe is very complicated. We cannot probe it directly in our laboratories. The energies that the largest colliders reach is um, 10 to 15 orders of magnitude lower than what we would need. But we know that something had to happen at that stage in the history of the universe. And there's this, this graphic here where you can see what's the radius of our observed universe today. And it grew, it grew very rapidly in that very short phase. And then it continued this, this normal expansion. Why do we know that this happened in that very early phases of the universe? There are two main reasons why inflation was invented, in fact, by uh, Alan Guth and others uh, two decades ago. One is that our universe is what cosmologists say it's spatially flat. If, universe, sorry, if inflation hadn't happened, our universe would have recollapsed many, many, many billions of years ago or either it would be completely empty of matter. We wouldn't be here. So the only option for us to be here today is that inflation has happened in the very early stages of the universe. The other need that we have to invent inflation is for the generation of these seeds for 
the growth of galaxies, stars and clusters. Unless we have something like inflation, we cannot have the initial conditions to have galaxies and clusters during the history of the universe. So people have been working on this. There's quite a detailed modeling, but it's all phenomenological. We don't have the physics to describe inflation today. We know it happened. We can constrain the parameter space because we know galaxies are here. We know that we are here, but we don't have the physics supporting it. So, in fact, the very first question is, when did inflation happen? I mentioned 10 to the minus 43 seconds, but there's a huge range in time here. It's a factor of 10, and the physics is extremely different. It could have happened at what we call the Planck time, which is when gravity decouples from the rest of the basic interactions in matter, or it could have happened 10 times later in the history of the universe. And then the physics is completely different. It has nothing to do. And we don't know which one of the two is the one that happened. Um, so uh, we believe we have two ways to probe inflation directly. Of course, we cannot send spacecraft there. The Big Bang is no longer there. We have to make observations which are sensitive enough to things that happen during the inflationary period. And we believe that there are only two ways to do that. One is through the measurement of the gravitational wave background. The other one is measuring the anisotropies in the polarization of the microwave background. And I will spend one minute on each of those ways. The basic thing is that during inflation, there are lots of gravity waves produced. What is a gravity wave? A gravity wave is just the propagation of a sudden change, large change in the gravitational field somewhere in, th in the space. If you have a supernova explosion, if you have the collapse of a black hole, if you have a collision between two stars, that produces lots of gravity waves. This is perturbations in the gravity field that propagate through space in the form of tiny ripples in space-time. Those ripples are extremely small. You need very sensitive instrumentation to detect gravity waves to the extent that after many, many years of effort, none of them has yet been detected. But we know that gravity waves were copiously produced during the inflationary phase. We can either detect them directly, that would produce a background, a cosmic background of gravitational waves, or we can measure, try to measure, the anisotropies induced by those gravity waves in the cosmic microwave background. But to do that, we need to go much beyond what the COBE satellite did um, 15 years ago. We need to go much beyond what the WMAP satellite did a few years ago, and even beyond what ESA's Planck satellite will do in a couple of years from now. We need to measure polarized microwave background. This is a very difficult task. WMAP has done the first attempt. It's this red curve here. It has a few tentative detections. It's far from conclusive. We need to do a much more sensitive mission to measure the polarization of the microwave background if we want to have a direct view of inflation. Of course, the other option is to observe gravity waves directly. This, this ESA NASA mission called LISA, which we hope it will fly sometime in about a decade from now. Uh, but even LISA, which is this huge interferometer consisting of three spacecraft separated millions of kilometers and with much more powerful lasers than the one that I'm using to point at the screen, of course, um, to measure those small ripples in space that have been produced by huge gravitational collapses. Not even LISA will be able to measure the background of gravity waves produced by inflation. We would need a much more sensitive instrument that uh, it has not yet been designed to measure that gravity wave background. But that is part of our dreams for the next decades. The other big question is the nature of dark energy. 
as I said before, dark energy is 73% of our universe, so it's the most important constituent of our universe. It's dark, it doesn't shine, and it's energy. It means that it doesn't produce gravity like normal matter. It, in fact, produces an acceleration in the expansion of the universe. Normal matter decelerates the expansion of the universe. Matter pulls matter together. The energy drives matter apart. So dark energy makes the universe expand in an accelerated form. The universe is expanding more rapidly every day. But of course, we just know this number and nothing else. We don't even know what is the approximate pressure of the dark energy. We know it's negative because it produces this acceleration. But we don't know whether it's um, a constant pressure, uh, whether it evolves with cosmic time. There are physical theories that can explain dark energies. And there's a whole collection of them. There's thousands of physical theories that predict dark energy in some sort of, of, of shape. But most of them are wrong. The point is that we don't know which, which one is the right one. And to do that, we need to measure very accurately the pressure of the dark energy. And we also need to know whether it evolves with cosmic history or not. There are several ways to do that. Clusters of galaxies are a very promising way to do this. Counting clusters as a function of epoch in the cosmic history that is very sensitive to the pressure of dark energy. There are other ways like the large-scale distribution of clusters. Counting supernovae type 1a, that is how dark energy has been discovered. We need to do it that much better, much fainter supernovae to much earlier cosmic epochs to determine the pressure of um, the dark energy. Weak gravitational lensing is another way, and uh, I will at the end discuss how I think we can do that. Now, second part of my talk, the development of the universe. That's all very nice, dark matter, dark energy, but of course we cannot see dark matter or dark energy. What we can see in the universe is matter that shines. Stars, of course, that's the classical thing that we observe in astronomy. Black holes, I will devote some effort in describing how we can see black holes, although that appears to be a contradiction because black holes by definition are black, so they don't emit any light. But of course, when matter falls into a black hole, it produces a lot of energy. And that energy is radiated mostly in the X-ray band, which you may remember from the introduction is my field. So I will talk about black holes because those are my pets. Um, and gas, there is a lot of atoms and uh, ions around the universe that also shine. And we can use them to uh, know more about the structure of the universe. So let me go one by one through these three components that are visible components of our universe, living in that substrate. So just to make it clear, what I'm now trying to do is to go from the dark universe to the visible universe. The substrate of, your, of our universe is dictated by dark energy and dark matter, but what we see is galaxies, gas and black holes. How do we go from the dark components to the visible components? Of course, gravity is a major player in here. Gravity is what pulls matter together to form galaxies, stars, clusters, and planets. But this is qualitatively very nice. Quantitatively, it's not as simple as it may look like. Stars. Okay, how do stars form? Um, we think we know more or less how galaxies, which is where stars live, form. And people are devoting lots of efforts with supercomputers to understand how galaxies form. On the top row you have the evolution of um, formation of um, a galaxy. It's actually, I think, a cluster of galaxies. From the initial conditions where you have a very smooth distribution of matter, when you let the time go by, 
gravity acts and pulls matter together and you can see, you can watch how these galaxies form. In fact, this is a little animation from Gustavo Yepes at the Autonomous University of Madrid, um, uh, where using the Mare Nostrum supercomputer in Barcelona, he can follow the formation of a, clusters of, of a cluster of galaxies. You can see this is the dark matter density, the underlying dark matter, which is what produces the gravity, and this is the gas. And you can see how those galaxies, those are galaxies already, they merge, they collide, they grow, they form those huge galaxies that we see in the centers of the clusters of galaxies. And this is very nice. This is numerical experiments that help us to understand what we see in the universe. But of course, we don't see that picture. We just see the end product. And we want to understand how this end product form um, before we can understand how galaxies form. Um, the very first galaxies that formed in the universe, uh, we have a technological limit as of today to reach those very first galaxies because Hubble Space Telescope, the most successful maybe astronomy mission in space, and also ground-based observatories like the VLT, the Very Large Telescope in Chile, they have been able to find galaxies out to very early epochs. Cosmologists measure distances in a parameter that we call redshift, which is denoted by this letter Z. Um, Z equals zero is today. It's where we are. Z larger and larger is looking more into the past. So this, this is the scale on how far we have been able to go. Redshift equals six. That light, the light from those galaxies was emitted when the universe was only 10% of its current age, so about 1.4 billion years old only. That's how far we have been able to go as of today. The technological frontier we have, the technological barrier that we have, is that by that redshift, everything goes redshifted into the infrared. All the optical light, we receive it in the infrared band. So we have to build powerful infrared telescopes and send them to space to break this barrier. And that's what we are planning to do, again, in a collaboration between NASA and the European Space Agency to build the James Webb Space Telescope, which is an infrared telescope. We, can, we think that we can probe the epoch when the universe was reionized by the first stars and the first galaxies with this telescope. Um, but, of course, if we want to see the stars themselves, the problem is that um, to form a star, you need a cooler. Stars form from the collapse of atoms, but, of course, those atoms have to cool. And the cooler is molecules. Molecules absorb optical and ultraviolet light, and they re-emit it in the infrared. And the only molecule that could have been formed when the very first stars were begun to, 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 to be formed was the molecular hydrogen. And molecular hydrogen, it, it has all the features, all the emission, all the absorption in the far infrared. It's even worse than looking at the first galaxies. Looking at the first stars means going not even to the near or the mid infrared. You have to go to the far infrared. And, of course, there are space missions. You can only do that from space, like Spitzer now and Herschel uh, from 2008 that are aimed at resolving that component of the extragalactic background light. The far infrared background is produced by the stars that have been forming along cosmic history. And we hope that with those missions we can resolve and understand where this background comes from and what is the cosmic history of star formation in the universe. Black holes, um, black holes, you all know what they are. Black holes are 
very massive bodies concentrated in very tiny places of space, so the gravity around those black holes is huge. In fact, not even the light can escape from a black hole. Um, in the last decade, I think that one of the biggest discoveries among exoplanets and many other exciting things, it's been the discovery that all galaxies host a massive black hole in their center. Our own galaxy, in fact, hosts a massive black hole of about three million solar masses in its center. And that has been a discovery of infrared astronomy. The center of our galaxy is full of gas and dust, so if you look there with the, the most powerful optical telescope, you won't see anything, you have to use the infrared. And the group by Gensel and Eckhart and others at Max Planck in, in Garching, during a many year campaign, they have been able to track the orbits of stars around the galactic center, so they have been able to measure directly the mass of our galactic center, and we know that it has to be a black hole. It cannot be a star or a star cluster or anything else. Only a massive black hole can explain those striking motions of the stars around our uh, galactic center. But even more, we know that all the nearby galaxies where we have been able to do this exercise, we detect very rapid motions in the centers of our galaxies, which need a massive object in the center, which we believe is a, ma is a black hole, containing about four, from somewhere from 0 0.4 to 0.6% of the mass of the galaxy in the form of a single large black hole in the center. So all galaxies we believe today have a massive black hole which has a mass between a million and a billion solar masses. Unfortunately, in 90% of the galaxies like our own, this black hole is dormant. It's not active. It's not eating matter from its surroundings, so it's not shining in X-rays, which is what we need to study black holes in detail. Now, we believe that black holes were formed in a specific way, but this is only theory. We have never seen a black hole forming. We, of course, want to know when the first massive black hole formed in the history of the universe. And we want to know whether this black hole formed before or after the first stars formed in the history of the universe. We have different theories that predict one way or the other way around. And this is only theory. We don't have observations yet that tell us when the first black holes formed. Even more, um, we know that, I think I'm going to skip that picture, we know that black holes um, uh, grow mostly by accretion. Accretion is just a funny word to describe a very simple fact, which is matter falling into the black hole and losing all its energy. And a fraction of that energy is released in the form of energy. Black holes are the most efficient power plants in the universe. They are able to convert mass into energy with an efficiency of 10%. This is just striking. Nuclear fusion is only efficient at the level of 0.7%. This is far more efficient in converting matter into energy. But you need a black hole. And even more, you need a rotating black hole. This is a technologism that uh, you, when you do the computations in general relativity, unless you have a rotating black hole, you will never get an efficiency in production of energy of more than a few percent. And we know that those massive black holes are, have an efficiency of around 10%. I don't have time to explain you why we know that, but believe me. <laughs> Another way for black holes to grow, but we believe, and this is only a belief, that this is not the driving mechanisms for black holes to grow, is by merging. Occasionally, we have found binary black holes in the centers of galaxies, but this is only occasionally. We believe that those huge black holes in the center of this galaxy, NGC 6240, will merge in a few billion years, but we have never seen something like that 
um, life, right? Which is what, of course, we would like to know and we will never do. Um, so we need to test whether all these ideas are correct, how those black holes were born many, many years ago from small objects, 10 solar masses to millions or billions of solar masses that they have today. Uh, no, okay. I'm going to skip that one again. The echo of the growth of those massive black holes is contained in the cosmic X-ray background. I just want to remind here that in 2003, Ricardo Giacconi got the Nobel Prize because, among other things, he discovered the cosmic X-ray background in 1962. This is, again, an isotropic background that is produced by the integrated emission from all the growing black holes in the universe. When a black hole grows, by accretion, it radiates a lot of energy. Most of that energy goes to the X-ray band, and we can detect this and study it with a lot of detail with our X-ray satellites today. And this is the spectrum of the X-ray background. It has nothing to do with the microwave background, which has its origin in the Big Bang. This is the echo of the growth of the black holes. And we uh, believe we know its origin, but there's a lot of quantitative details that we still don't know. And gas, that's the third component of the observable universe. The majority of the gas that we know, by gas I mean plasma, um, or neutral gas, that doesn't matter, it's in the clusters of galaxies. Clusters of galaxies are um, uh, condensates of hundreds to thousands of galaxies that they, are, um, they stay together because there is a strong gravity field that keeps them together. And we know that that gravity field is produced by dark matter. The matter contained on those galaxies is by far not enough to keep clusters bound. Um, this is an optical image of the Coma Cluster, which is one of the richest clusters and best, studies, best studied clusters of galaxies in the universe. And this is an X-ray image of the Coma Cluster. X-rays actually show us where the gas is. This gas has a temperature of tens to hundreds of millions of degrees, and therefore it radiates mostly through um, Bremsstrahlung, which is breaking radiation. This is the plasma of, of, um, um, contributed by the gas in those galaxies, which has been heated by the same dark matter potential well to those extremely large temperatures. But by studying this gas, we can know with a lot of accuracy what is the dark matter distribution in those clusters. And what, we have been doing that for many years now, and we know that gravity is not the only important actor in that story. We know that there is a lot more of physics going on in those clusters. It's not just that gravity keeps that gas together and heats it up. We know that there has to be um, other mechanisms like uh, conduction, uh, thermal mixing, the black holes hitting the gas again, magnetic fields, Lots of complicated physics that we need to explain the structure of the gas that we see in clusters of galaxies. And let me remind you again that this is where most of the gas in the universe that we know resides today. But as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, we only know 50% of the ordinary matter uh, and most of it resides in clusters, but the other 50%, we still don't know where it is. We suspect, but it's only a suspicion at the moment, that it resides in the intergalactic medium. That means in the space between galaxies and clusters that we see empty today. But we see it empty because we don't have sensitive enough instruments to see what is in there. That is a nice simulation, but again, note the, note the word, it's a simulation, it's not something that we know, it's something that we imagine only, of the gas 
in intergalactic space. It has this funny filamentary structure that all cosmological theories predict. But of, co of course we, we've seen none of that. To see that gas, we believe it has a temperature of around hundreds of thousands of degrees to tens of millions of degrees, we need to either do very sensitive imaging in X-rays or maybe do some sort of absorption studies or something that requires, in any case, more sensitive instrumentation than what we have today. But don't forget that this contains, hopefully, the other half of the ordinary matter that we don't see in clusters of galaxies. I've talked about these three components, but they are linked together. They are not independent components. Stars, black holes, and gas, they are made of the same stuff. They are made of baryons, atoms, ions, electrons, ordinary matter. And there is a lot of influence between these three components. For example, we know that the growth of a massive black hole in the center of a galaxy it's strongly related to the formation of stars in that galaxy. And we know that because star formation, we can see it in the far infrared, as I said before, and the growth of black holes, we can see it in X-rays. And we know that in many cases, there is a direct link between the X-ray emission and the far infrared and submillimeter emission in galaxies. So there has to be a link between those processes. There have been numerical, again, simulations, studies on what is the feedback between those two processes. And there's a very nice work by Volker Springle, Tiziana Di Matteo and others where they have simulated the collision of two galaxies with huge massive black holes in their centers. And they can study what happens with the formation of stars with the parameter that we call star formation rate when there is one such collision, there is a burst in the formation of stars, and when that happens, we believe that these galaxies will form a quasar, which is the most explosive object that we know in the universe, aside from gamma ray burst. Now, if we switch off black holes, if black holes would not exist in the centers of galaxies, Star formation would continue, would continue as it was happening before the collision. But if black holes exist in the centers of those galaxies, they will stop the formation of stars after the collision. So there is a lot of interplay between the formation of black holes and the formation of stars. Of course, the formation of heavy elements. I mentioned helium and deuterium at the beginning of my talk, but all the rest of the elements, in, uh, of the chemical elements, have been formed in stars. Those stars, some of them, the most massive ones, end up their days blowing up in the form of a supernova, and they pollute the interstellar medium and the whole galaxy, and maybe the intergalactic medium, with heavy elements. For example, if you look at iron, which is an element which is fairly abundant in the universe, it's very strange that we see that the abundance of iron stays constant up to very early epochs in the history of the universe. That means that most of the iron in the history of the universe, it was formed before what we can reach today with our telescopes. So the formation of the heavy elements, the cosmochemistry of the university is beyond our current capabilities. We know that. So we have to build more powerful and sensitive instruments to study that. I have also mentioned that, that clusters of galaxies, the gas that is in there is heated by the black holes. When those black holes accrete, they shine, they produce lots of X-rays, radio waves that blows up gas heats it up and prevents the gas from cooling. So, I think what we need to explore this further way is better facilities, much more sensitive instrumentation, and this is my last two biographs, um, and a very 
fruitful collaboration between ground-based instrumentation and space-borne instrumentation. And uh, I'm, I'm just listing here a bunch of ideas very quickly to probe inflation and dark energy. This is missions and infrastructures that people have imagined. Um, to probe this, yellow is ground-based, blue is space. Um, some of these things can be done from the ground, others just cannot. And to probe the development of the universe, stars, black holes and gas, there's lots of ideas, lots of projects, James Webb, Herschel, ALMA. This is from the ground, square kilometer array, very large telescope, gigantic optical and infrared telescopes of um, 30 to 100 meters of aperture from the ground, huge X-ray space observatories to watch the black holes grow, um, gravity waves, which have a very important role in telling us where those gravitational cataclysms occur in the universe. I think we've got plans, we've got ideas, we've got projects, probably we need money. Um, very last view graph, just to summarize, I, I think we have made a lot of progress in understanding our universe over the last decades. There have been some surprises. Dark energy, no one was expecting that. I was teaching cosmology 15 years ago in my university, and there was no dark energy to be seen in my lectures. That just did not exist. That was proposed by Einstein, in fact, in, in his equations for other reasons. Now all cosmology books have dark energy, and that's only one decade old. But beyond learning many things, we also open many new questions. Um, I think that we have many unknowns and we know what we, what we need to answer those questions. In the future, for the future, I think that we have clear science goals, we have projects. They are very challenging, especially in the economic front, uh, also in the technological front. And my last statement is that the quest for the universe is as old as Mankin. Please be supportive to these studies. Thank you very much. This was a quick tour through 14 billions of years in the past, a couple of billion of years in the future, and Javier also gave us quite some work to do for the next couple of years that will keep us off the streets. Uh, I guess you are as breathless from this trip as I am, but there might be a couple of questions that are still open. Yes, please. Press the button on your microphone and sp please identify yourself and speak. Uh, good afternoon. My name is, is uh, Tony Gross from NASA Ames uh, Research Center. Um, I hope this is not an improper question. What can you say about the time before the Big Bang or w w what occurred? Uh, okay, I can give you the official answer to that, <laughs> which doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right one. General relativity says that the Big Bang is the creation of matter and space-time. So, asking the question what happened before the Big Bang is equivalent to the question what is outside the universe. There is absolutely nothing outside the universe. By definition, the universe is everything. So what was before the Big Bang? The, as I say, the official answer is there was nothing before the Big Bang, not even time. That is the official orthodox um, answer. Um, uh, when you go into the details, it's far more complex than that. When gravity um, is in its quantum behavior uh, before what I call the Planck time, the concept of time 
has a completely different meaning. It, it's actually messed up with the concept of matter. Matter and time and space-time have parallel roles. So it's not even clear that from time equals zero to time 10 to the minus 43 seconds, you could measure time with a clock. But, of course, this is all theory. I mean, we have really no way to know. Yeah, Octavio Camino from the European Space Agency. Uh, just one question. You look, uh, seem to be looking for 50% of a material. How do you know that this is missing, this 50%? Okay. Um, uh, there are several um, um, ways to measure the total amount of, of ordinary matter in the universe. One is the light element abundance in the universe. The abundance of helium, deuterium, uh, especially those two, but also lithium-7, only um, can only be explained in their correct abundances if the amount of ordinary matter in the universe is what it is. It's 4.5%. If you have more matter, you don't produce deuterium. Deuterium is also destroyed in the Big Bang, very shortly after the Big Bang, if you have too much ordinary matter. Um, if you have too few ordinary matter, you don't produce enough helium. So there's a very delicate balance in there, and there's consistency if the amount of ordinary matter is about 4.5%. Now, this is one way. The other way is from the cosmic microwave background itself. Um, the anisotropies of the, cosmic, of the cosmic microwave background are also sensitive to the amount of ordinary matter, and you can measure that, and it's again consistent with that number. So that's, that's a double check, and it's, it's consistent. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Bob Sack. I'm formerly from NASA. My, uh, my question is, you barely touched on the role, the contributions to this puzzle of the uh, X-ray uh, telescopes in space, such as uh, HEO and Chandra, maybe 10 to the minus, between 10 to the minus 43rd and 10 to the minus 33rd seconds spent on that one. Uh, were there no contributions in mapping black holes, understanding black holes? You barely said anything about that. Could you please expand? Well, first of all, I have to apologize. I should have said that before. Um, I have an obvious European bias, um, very obvious. Uh, it was only meant to, um, to um, show examples, not, um, no, not to ignore everything else. Um, of course, the, you know, I'm an X-ray astronomer. I've, I've worked with data from NASA missions for many years. Uh, I, I have colleagues in the U.S. and, um, you know, the, um, uh, the, the history of X-ray astronomy and what we know about black holes today is largely due to missions like Einstein, the, um, also the HEO one, which, in fact, I showed the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background, which was measured by this one by HEO 1A2, which is also a very nice mission, which I did lots of work on. And it's the only reliable measurement that, until today, we have of the spectrum of the X-ray background. Um, sorry. Apologies again. I really was meant to say that at the beginning of my talk, and I forgot it. Of course. Uh, Scott Hatton, um, is there something special about the center of the galaxy that causes a black hole to appear there, or is the galaxy there because of the black hole? That, that we don't know. It's the chicken and the hen, right? Uh, no, the chicken and the egg, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> of course, the center of the galaxy is where the gravity potential well is deeper. It's, it's, it's where most of the matter is concentrated, if uh, at least the visible matter, and we believe that the, uh, the dark matter as well. Uh, if, if you plot the surface brightness of any galaxy, it, it rises towards the center because it's, it's got many more stars. This is because the uh, gravitational potential is very deep in there. There's a lot of gravity in that place. And that's where matter is being fed, and that's where the black hole was formed. Now, whether the galaxy formed first and later the black hole grew, or whether there was first a black hole and then the galaxy began to assemble. That is the chicken and the egg question. We don't know that. 
my name is Gerard from the Netherlands. Uh, I want to know if you could characterize the role of the Lijo facility. Sir, uh, sorry, uh, can you repeat the last? Uh, can bit? you characterize the role of the Lijo facility on Earth to detect uh, gravity waves and uh, the attached distributed computing project called Einstein at Home? Okay, um, LIGO, I hope I've got this graph somewhere, the sensitivity of uh, uh, gravitational wave detectors. Uh, uh -huh. This one, uh, well, it doesn't come in here, okay, but anyway, that will be... Okay, that is sens the sensitivity, uh, this is dying, this is the, sen oh, it's not dying, um, this is frequency of the gravity wave, and this is the amplitude of the perturbation. Uh, by the way, those numbers are really very small. This is 10 to the minus 13. Okay. Um, LISA, which is a space project, is focused on low frequencies. From the Earth, uh, in a detector, in an experiment like LIGO, you cannot reach those frequencies. It works at higher frequencies, something like, well, it's not that large. Uh, oh, here it is, ground-based uh, gravitational wave interferometers. That's, that's basically the sensitivity of LIGO. Now, the point is that the uh, um, physical phenomena that you can study with low and high frequencies is very different. Um, at, at low frequencies, we should be able to, to see uh, phenomena which are much more common than at high frequencies, or that we believe that astrophysics tells us that those phenomena will be much more common. For example, um, 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 black hole mergers, neutron star, neutron star mergers, things like that will produce a signal which is in the low frequency range. On the high frequency range, we don't expect that many cataclysms to happen. So it's, it's different. Uh, phenomena being explored by the two ranges. And unfortunately, from the ground, we cannot access the low frequency domain because, you know, anything produces lots of perturbations. I'm struck by the precision of your pie chart. 4% ordinary matter, 23% dark matter, 73% dark energy. And since so much of this is theoretical, it seems a little presumptuous to, that we know what the 100 percent is. But I'm actually mostly curious, 10 years ago, before we knew about dark energy, what was your pie chart composed of? And what do you think the odds are after we launch some of these additional missions that in another 20 years the uh, percentages will be very different? That, that's a very good question. Um, um, okay. Uh, before 10 years ago, um, it wasn't clear what the total amount of, of stuff in the universe was. That was the main uncertainty. Um, there were contradictory results in the sense that some, I mean, people also wanted to have a universe which is what we call spatially flat, which means that uh, the total density in the universe has a precise value that makes space flat. But of course, people saw that the amount of dark matter was not enough to make the universe as dense as they believed it, was, it, it needed to be. So there, there were some problems and contradictions with that. And um, dark energy came uh, into the right. Oh, there was still another contradiction that I forgot to mention, which is the age of the universe. If you have a universe with the critical density, which, is, which means that it's spatially flat, the age of the universe is at most 11 billion years. And we know globular clusters which are more than 13 billion years old. So there was a problem in there. And that problem was known, um, you know, over many, many decades. Of course, there were many other uncertainties. For example, the expansion rate of the universe that also comes into all this game. There was lots of uncertainties in that number. Um, again, uh, over the last 10 years, we have measured it accurately, accurately meaning 10% uh, error, which is quite a lot for cosmology. Uh, but that was not the situation 10 years ago. So there were many more uncertainties than just um, the, uh, you know, this bit not being there. But, uh, you know, besides the uncertainties, there were contradictions. And there were people supporting 
very small values of the expansion of the universe because that made everything consistent with just that bit of dark matter um, and you know others had other favorite cosmological models today I think there's no discrepancy for you know 99% of the cosmologists that this is the, the the right picture but again let me say that this is again thanks to the fact that we have measured accurately also other parameters that are not in this graph like the Hubble constant which is the the expansion rate of the universe so we have no more freedom in the other cosmological parameters Okay, I, I see there's still many questions open. I can only accept one last question because there's another event going on here. Um, Heinz? Heinz Sturva, Space Associates. One notable absence in your discussion was uh, radio astronomy. So I have yep. a very specific question. What contribution can radio astronomy uh, do to this whole story of uh, cosmology? And maybe a sub-question, which is in the context of uh, projects like uh, putting a radio astronomy telescope uh, low far on the moon, which is one of the discussions which is ongoing. Can you make a, a short uh, summary as to what radio astronomy can do and what maybe such a project on the moon could do? Okay. I, I don't think I'm um, um, literate enough to comment on the last part of the question. Um, I, I agree and I accept the criticism that I didn't go into radio astronomy um, very much, although most of the microwave background measurements have been made in, in, with radio antennas, with centimeter antennas for many years in the pre-COBE era. It, that was all we knew about the cosmic microwave background. Um, uh, but there's a lot more that radio astronomy tells us, and I, I, I just... Uh, listed here for the future, um, uh, star formation, that has a lot to do with radio astronomy. Um, ALMA, for example, this, this huge um, millimeter and uh, submillimeter ground-based um, uh, um, observatory, worldwide observatory, that is specifically targeted to, to watch star formation, and that's extremely important. Radio waves can also penetrate very deeply into those very hostile environments, lots of molecules and dust where stars are formed. That's, that's one very important contribution we, we, we hope to, to have. And, and of course, um, I, I couldn't send another arrow here, but we also know a lot about black holes because of radio astronomy. About 10% of the active galaxies, those that have black holes that accrete matter efficiently, have, are very powerful in the radio band. And many of them show radio jets. That means material ejected at huge distances at relativistic speeds. In fact, there was a very nice prediction that was later confirmed by uh, radio observations by Martin Rees and others, where they predicted that those jets being, um, having speeds close at the, uh, to the speed of light would be asymmetric. We would only see one of the two jets, and that's a prediction of general relativity, in fact. And that was, was proven by radio astronomy. There's a lot of contribution of radio astronomy here, and there's going to be a lot of contribution in radio astronomy in, in the future. And, and low far, I didn't put it here because I didn't have space, but ALMA, millimeter, and SCAE, centimeter, more in the future, will, will have a lot, a lot to say. Thank you. Um, as you. As you move out, please, there are evaluation forms on your desk. Fill them in, tick excellent everywhere, put it outside on the table. There's one announcement that I would like to make. In, in about 10 minutes, a movie will be shown here. This is also on your uh, table. It's uh, the world premiere of the movie, What's Going Up on There? And... Um, uh, you, you notice that Star Wars is also part of it. So let's give um, Javier Balcons a final clap and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much.